Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our Harasa session. The session is entitled Indicators of Growth, Yield Curves for Investors. I'll tell you right now that we'll, we will spend a, a little bit of time today talking about yield curves, um, the markets and economy, but we've got a much, I think, a much broader remit to discuss and uh, an awful lot of things to discuss um, with, uh, with, our, with our panel. I'll start by introducing myself. I'm Daniel Kern. I'm the Chief Investment Officer of TFC Financial Management. We are an investment advisor that works primarily with individuals and families based in Boston, Massachusetts. Um, we celebrated our 40th anniversary as a firm during the pandemic. Um, we are still looking forward to actually celebrating in person with our clients, hopefully later this year. I'm also uh, a board member and independent trustee of the Green Century Funds, which is an environmentally focused mutual fund family also based in Boston. I suspect we may touch on ESG during the session, so I think my Green Century involvement is, is also relevant. Svana, would you introduce yourself? Yes, <clears throat> my name is Svana Gunnarsdóttir. I'm the founding uh, and managing partner of Frumtak Ventures. Here in Iceland, Reykjavík, we have uh, three funds. Uh, we uh, have been for 14 years, and we mainly invest in uh, tech, uh, tech companies, uh, growing outside, obviously growing outside of Iceland, international. So, just very quickly. <laughs> Thanks. And, a previous live an entrepreneur turned uh, VC. <laughs> Fantastic. Torsten, welcome. Hello, thank you very much. For me, it's a little bit the other way around. I'm a bit of an entrepreneur and just now working mainly in consulting and as a professor for economics at a university in Berlin. Uh, our clients actually, we are pretty much uh, trying to help our clients to win the trust from the, um, partly from their targets, actually, which has been uh, increasingly complicated over recent years because there's so much money out there and, and the possible targets, the entrepreneurs, oftentimes are pretty critical when it comes to kind of accept, accepting bids or, or even just talk to people who would like to invest. So what we try to do is help them find the right targets, of course, but on the other hand, also convince the targets that they might uh, want to meet the right investors. So I'm looking forward to a very lively discussion, actually. Thanks. Well, welcome. So we're well, well, we're well represented uh, geographically in, in the Harasa spirit. We've got Iceland, Germany, and the, and, and the U.S. I think we bring a different geographic perspective to the table. But I'll start today by talking about um, what's been going on in the public markets. We started out the year after, after a couple of you know, really terrific years in the stock market, despite a pretty gloomy global picture because of COVID, we've, we've had a couple of really strong years of market performance. But this year has been kind of more of a, more of a, a thud as, as markets have gone down. And at the start of the year, um, we, we were really worried about um, Federal Reserve policy and central bank policy around the world rising and stubbornly high in inflation, um, concerns uh, about a variety of geopolitical events, and that's really segued into worries about the invasion of Ukraine by, by Russia. Um, the public market turbulence, in some ways, at an index level, masks even, even more difficult things going on under the surface, um, particularly in, in the States, with some of the high potential growth, but more speculative areas of the market um, have really corrected more sharply than the, than the headline indexes. Um, and so it, it's been a pretty rough start to the year. And I, I think we'll, we'll discuss Russia and Ukraine separately, but I, I think that in a lot of ways, the, the, the commentators are getting certain things wrong in thinking about inflation. So certainly in the States, we've seen inflation at levels that I haven't seen since the misery index of the, the Carter years um, and the, the, uh, the early years of, of Reagan's presidency. Um, we are at, at multi-decade highs. Um, but I think when I look out on the horizon and think about where we go from here, I think there's a lot of reason to think that that inflation will go down, maybe not to pre-pandemic levels, but I, I think the economy will heal from here. And uh, 
the couple of things that I'd like to, to highlight. One, we've had goods prices really explode. And part of that is relates to supply chain issues that, that resulted from COVID. Part of it is we've all been spending money on goods because we've been locked down in our homes and unable to go out and spend on services. So I just think about my own situation. I was um, a captive of our house on Cape Cod. I needed um, office equipment for my home office. I bought some technology equipment. My wife bought exercise equipment. We did a house remodel. All of these things created supply chain and really exacerbated supply chain issues. On top of that, you know, auto companies, which um, have over the past several decades shown themselves capable of, of creating self-inflicted wounds time and time again, they dramatically cut back on their purchases of semiconductors and then found themselves unable to get enough semiconductors to, to, uh, to manufacture cars. So we've had a huge spike in inflation related to new and used car prices. Those things gradually, so um, I've spent a lot of the money that I'm going to spend on home remodeling. I'm going out to dinner again. So some of the spending that was in the goods category has shifted to, to the services, and we're already seeing that start to happen. That should take some of the pressure off of, off of supply chains. We're catching up on the semiconductor front. I think that's you know, also I see green shoots positive progress there. The third area of inflation is wages. And we, we have more so in the U.S. than outside the U.S., but there's a real labor crunch in, in the U.S. We had about 5 million workers that were out of the workforce because they were caring for children that weren't able to go to school or go to daycare. We had a couple of million workers who stepped away from the workforce because they were concerned about either catching COVID or spreading it to family members. We also had a higher number of retirees than, um, than the pre-pandemic trend. And you add to that immigration numbers that are at multi-decade lows, and there's a big gap in the U.S. workforce. I think as, we, as COVID becomes more endemic than a pandemic, we should start to see some people coming back to the workforce. That should take some pressure off of, off of inflation and take some of the pressures um, off, of the, off of the market. Um, and so um, I, I don't see, I'm not um, complacent about inflation. I think when we come out the other side of this for a variety of reasons, including deglobalization, I think we come out of this from a, a, a normal of inflation at 2% or below to a new normal of inflation between 25 and 3%. Um, but I think the U.S. economy and m much of the globe can live with inflation at higher, at slightly higher, higher levels. Uh, so that, to me, is the, the inflation story. The markets are discounting, I think, that that we get to a, a reasonable level of inflation within the next 12 to 18 months. Um, so I think the bond markets at least are, uh, are representing what I think is, is my, my point, of, point of view. On the stock side of things, so all the headlines are going to, you know, really, this is all about interest rates and Fed policy um, and the market is reassessing the discount rates for, in particular, for companies that have earnings far in the future. Kind of, Savannah, your, your sweet spot as, a, as an investor, the more speculative companies that, that have great prospects, but more of those prospects are going, going to come in out years rather than, than near-term years. I think that's part of the picture. But I think another part of the picture is that markets are reassessing the total addressable market for some of these stocks. And I think Peloton is a really good example. During the pandemic, I think the markets overestimated what the total addressable market was for companies like, like Peloton. And I think there's a little bit of a rediscounting of what their, what their trajectory is. I think also, if you look at a company like Netflix, there's also a reassessment of the competitive landscape. And as their growth in, in subscribers has decelerated, there's a little bit of a, of a reassessment of, of how rapidly they can grow and how rapidly they can grow into their valuation. Um, 
because uh, there have been a lot of, of entrants really taking share share of wallet. Um, on the Russia Ukraine side, I think maybe we 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 cover that in the the second the second part of our discussion. Um, I think now would be a good time for me to I've I've got my point of view about um, what's happening in the market and where we're going on the public market side. I'd love to hear, Svana, from you, um, the, the, the private markets may be looking very different to you. And what are you seeing and what opportunities are, are interesting to you in this environment? Yeah, I think, I mean, definitely uh, the private market is not correlating with the movements of the, the, the public market. So it's very difficult now with the public market, with the inflation and, you know, with the war and everything going on to speculate how that is going to move. It's different in the private market. Uh, and uh, as the investment environment continues now to involve, uh, like, you know, all the investors uh, are adapting to the COVID-19 pandemic, pandemic and how that has been evolving, I believe that private asset will play an increasingly important strategic role uh, in the portfolios for the long term. And there are absolutely fantastic, uh, uh, compelling opportunities in this uh, asset in, in the private. Uh, and why private markets? Um, like I said, the increasing number of investors are broadening their asset allocation across private markets. Both more investors are going into private markets and also globally. We, we see it a lot also that we're getting U.S. investors interested now in the private market, both in Europe and Nordics. You know, it is illiquid. It has not been, you know, uh, transparent, uh, but we see a great uh, interest into that market. Um, so I think in the bottom line, uh, the private market is stable. We can see that it's increasing in value. And actually, uh, COVID has uh, brought a lot of challenges, but also huge opportunities. And if I just speak close to us, like in our portfolio, we mainly invest in tech companies with SaaS solution, addressing real life problems. So actually solving something with a purpose, so you can see it. We have uh, our portfolio had the most transaction and value and the highest IRR uh, last year. So there's also a lot of opportunities in this landscape. Yeah. That's fantastic. A follow-up question, really, for, for, for both of you. I, I think, in, in, and maybe this is a function of, of me spending most of my time in, in the States, um, there seems to be a conventional wisdom that most of the innovation in the world is centered around the U.S. and China. Um, I, I think you would have a different point of view, and I would love to hear your perspective about the innovation that's, that's happening in the Nordics and in Europe that's not getting – the attention of, of a very, uh, you know, of, of a very um, U.S. and, and Asia-centric uh, media. You want me to, Torsten? Sure. Why don't you start and then I'll give you my, the Germans are great rent, okay? <laughs> yeah, you want me to go first? <laughs> I can start if, if you want. Um, I think the, um, there's, a, there's a misconception, I would, I, I would say, because I think the um, the way kind of R and D and and innovation works in in let's say Central Europe is much more uh, around clusters and ecosystems, and that's something that the Chinese and probably the Americans are not that familiar with. Uh, probably the Chinese, who actually partly, as far as I understand from my my visits in China, partly take take over parts of this kind of ecosystem idea. But if you look at Germany or France or I don't know, northern parts of, of, uh, of Europe, you see that there's a lot of clusters around the industrial uh, cores, right? So you have car companies like, let's say, Volkswagen in, in a rural area in Germany, and they alone, I think they have about two to 3,000 startups around them who actually work on uh, autonomous driving and kind of mobility of the future or something like that. That is... A different system, right? It is not. It's not easy. So a lot of investors we help, investment opportunities, need to get their head around that because it's not that easy. It's not that they are out there. Oftentimes it's just five engineers and ten other people who actually have one idea, one great thing. And as you know from the Germans, especially, there's a little bit of a tendency due to this ecosystem to kind of focus on rather incremental innovation than the big ideas. On the other hand, I have to say, 
I'm, I'm a bit of a fan of uh, the uh, Italian economist Mazzucato, who, who kind of worked a lot around the, the question, where does innovation come from? And her point is, in the United States, oftentimes the state kind of develops the, the basic ideas, like at the iPhone, right? There's the seven central parts have been developed with tons of U.S. state money. And then private innovators come and make something interesting out of that. That's probably different in, in Central Europe. That makes it much harder to kind of spot and identify the right investment opportunities. But on the other hand, it is also the, the good news is for investors, once you have spotted one, you're probably the only one, right? So there is uh, it's a lot more work to find the good uh, ideas, but it is uh, also more rewarding, I would assume. Makes sense. Yeah. And I think just if you look in the history, it uh, it does make total sense. I mean, access to capital and access to market has been, you know, much longer in the States. In Europe, it's like just, if I, if I speak about the venture, it's like just 20, 25 years old, you know, mm. that the venture model is uh, developing. So actually the companies uh, are being created that are, you know, for venture to, to actually grow this big, not just the farmer, you know, the milk shop on the corner or, you know, the small companies. Uh, so I think we have a much shorter history, so that explains a lot. And also coming from Europe, also take it just the, the Nordics. It's very, I mean, Nordic is like just like last decade or 15 years. But we are seeing great uh, companies being created, the unicorns. I mean, we have the, the, the most unicorn. I mean, we can always say per capita. I mean, in Iceland, we always win <laughs> per capita. But, uh, but uh, you can see, like, you know, um, Skype and, uh, and Spotify and all those companies coming out of, uh, uh, out of the Nordic. So we're actually seeing the companies being created and the attention is coming to this uh, part of the world because we don't really have any border. We had borders before, but now with the technology, if you have a, a, have a solution that is a, the addressable market, like you mentioned, it's you know endless and 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 so this is creating i think that will be shifting this definitely although I, if i may add one thing is uh, from my opinion or kind of experience and I, i'd be interested in your view on that i think it's much harder to get let's say a great refinancing or kind of rewarding system in europe right because normally if if you find a good startup Normally, they, they tend to actually somehow have a limited market, right? Because they look for they do something, let's say, for the automotive industry. So that means there's three OEMs in Germany who might be interested in doing business with them. So we don't have that, that European market in a way that is open to real new innovations. Oftentimes, you have to find or squeeze yourself into the existing structures. That makes it often oftentimes to my opinion very hard to to kind of earn the rewards you would actually expect even from a unicorn right if you look at let's say uh, medicine or something like that all these ai based tools are hardly to be you know squeezed in the markets in europe because of the structure of the national health systems and the state run health system stuff like that so i think it's less less that they the people are less inno innovative it's more that it's very hard in the existing structures to actually gain um, a good reward for, for good ideas. That's my opinion. Right? No, absolutely. Coming back to it's a very, Europe is a very fragmented market and with a different legislation. So it's all just very small markets in different areas. So for, for grow, growing, it's a big challenge. And also to add to that is uh, access to capital in Europe is up to a round. Uh, very often companies are sold uh, at that time. You know, so we exit too early. Hmm. So we have some time. We have some work to do there. Absolutely. Yeah, it's a very, very different dynamic. Very different dynamic here. One of the things that that I've noticed in this latest cycle of market volatility we've had in the in the public markets is that there's a profound mismatch between the time horizon of many of our investors and the time horizon for commercialization or realization of value for many investors. And I, I, I see that a lot in particular in the clean energy space where, where there is a, a, a lack of patience and you see these boom bust cycles where there's euphoria followed by abject depression. And you see these companies having, you know, having a tough time having a stable capital base because of the ups and downs. Torsten, I know this is an area that you, you spend some time on with your clients and I would really be interested in you know hearing about how you work on aligning the 
investor base with the investment opportunity? I think that's probably a relevant question for both of you to, to address. Of course, as a consultant, we always know all the answers, right? But in that, <laughs> in that case, I have to admit it's, it's a tough one, right? Because it's had increasingly in the last two years, three years, the private investors find it harder to even convince targets to accept their money, right? That's a ridiculous situation in a way, right? You, you, you <laughs> have a lot of money and approach a startup or something, and, and the startup people are like, hmm, listen, I don't know, I don't like these guys, they're probably not into that for very long, blah, blah, blah. And so th there's no greed, it's more like, you know, it's more, it's more like a matchmaking for a, for a marriage rather than uh, actually kind of getting people together who want to earn money together. It's probably a very German thing, but I heard so from other areas in Europe too. Uh, but you're right, especially when it comes to green investment, um, we all know that all our markets are pretty much under regulation, right? In different ways, probably in the US than they are in, in, in Germany. But we, we, of course, see an increasing interest and it will increase even more now after Ukraine into investing into, uh, let's say, let's just say re renewable energy to keep it simple, right? And again, uh, that means uh, you, you probably have a payback cycle of 10 to 15 years due to regulation. And that is something that private investors actually normally don't like, right? You would like to at least be able to sell off your investment after two to three years or something, which is not, we don't have a market for that. So that means on one hand, you have very, very picky startups, and then you have investors who are actually bound to the startups for about 10 to 15 years until things actually get interesting, which is not very helpful on the private side. I think it's different on the public markets um, because you have larger bundles, of course, and you know that shit. But um, I think that's that's a real hindrance for the for the private investors these days. Makes yeah, I think uh, if you can add to that, I totally agree. There's overflow of uh, capital, uh, you know, money seeking work. So actually, the entrepreneurs can re can be very selective in, in that sense. And um, it's also uncertainty about regulation in this market, which keeps also investors away because it's unclear how the regulations will uh, develop. Uh, and also, like uh, Torsten said about, you know, you need at a certain time to exit and it's an unclear path how you can exit those uh, investments. And I like if I speak just for us as a venture fund, I mean, this is outside of our time scope, basically, because we cannot see how we can exit it. So we, we stay away from it. And I mean, we are in Iceland in the, in the energy uh, heart of, uh, you know, so... Uh, it's a challenge, and and I think also you mentioned that now with the, with the Ukraine and and uh, Russia that now will be a big focus that we, uh, you know, nations become independent, you know, for the energy sources. Uh, I, I, that will be, I think, a main goal for the next decade that you're not dependent on somebody for your gas and oil. Right, but I think that, that there's large scale investment that is hardly done by private investors, right? No, exactly. That's what I foresee for Europe. Although there's a lot of startups and great ideas out there to increase at least efficiency of wind, and solar power, and stuff like that. But I think we'll see that this will be organized in a rather, you know, in a grand scheme of things, like you know, yeah. this kind of uh, raising funds and then actually investing at what 500 places at the same time, rather than um, kind of opening the market up for private investors. Right. Yes, like a European Union will like mm. invest for the Europe. You know, it, it, it's that scale. Absolutely. Well, that makes that makes sense. Well, why don't we segue and and spend a couple of minutes talking about um, about Russia and in Ukraine? Um, it's I, I don't think we can talk in any session today without uh, you know without um, um, framing the you know the implications uh, of what's happening for you know for uh, for the world in market terms which is which is where i which is where i live most of most of my life the the conventional wisdom is that normally 6 months and 12 months after a geopolitical event i um, including prior russian invasions and the iranian hostage crisis um, September 11th, typically the market, the, the equities are typically higher after a, a period of, uh, of, of disruption. Um, I am feeling a little less complacent about that. 
Um, I think that that this is a uh, a a major turning point for the world. We in equities have had um, you know, the wind the wind at our back for many decades. Between having four decades of declining interest rates and mostly declining rates of inflation, and a multi a multi decade peace dividend. Um, I think uh, I think we can safely say that going forward, um, r- rates and inflation will be a tougher challenge for stock valuations. And then I think we're seeing an unwinding, um, uh, unfortunately, of the peace dividend that we you know, that we started to benefit from after the fall of the Berlin Wall. Um, and so that's. You know, that creates really a turning point, I think, for for for, for markets. But I I'm curious. Um, I sit in the in the comfort of my of, of my office in Boston. I think I'm all by myself today. But um, shockingly, when we moved to a hybrid work schedule in the office, not everybody was clamoring to come back into the office on Fridays. Uh, we had. Three quarters of our of our staff here on Tuesday, and we've gradually dwindled as the week has passed. I live. I'm a 10 minute walk, so I'm I'm a low, I'm a low carbon worker. I have a 10 minute walk to work, so 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 I'm here. But I'm sitting in the comfort of of my Boston office. Um, both of you are a lot closer to the a lot closer to the action. So be very curious to hear, you know, the the reaction in your countries. And you're thinking about what this means for um, for where we go from here, for where you go as citizens, and where we go in terms of market as market participants. So, would you like to start, or? Yeah, uh, I can start, but you are closer. <laughs> no, <laughs> I, 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 I just think this is uh, first of all really sad, uh, both for Ukrainians and for a Russian as well. Uh, and um, I think it's, uh, I mean, you can have like a hope if you can see actually, like we discussed a little bit before we started uh, going live, is uh, if you actually could see uh, a solution that will yeah. be, you know, some kind of goal that you're reaching. And if people can reach that goal, that, you know, uh, we will have peace time again. So uh, we, you know, I, we don't see that. I mean, in Iceland, it's very much uh, for, I mean, we are part of NATO. NATO has uh, is very clear uh, message that we uh, we do not want war and we do not want invasion into a free country. Um, but um, I don't know. It's it's uh, nobody would believe and nobody believed there would be a war. And I think we're all a little bit shocked still that there is actually a war in Europe. And uh, and uh, and uh, also it's realistic. It could also come to the NATO nations and the Europeans in general. So it's it's affecting us. Yes, absolutely. I, I think we all agree that that we actually condemn this. Uh, act of war. So so we don't have to dig deeper on that one. I think we're all shocked. We're all actually trying to help. Berlin actually is facing the first wave of Ukrainian refugees. And, and I'm, I'm actually, I have to say that I'm, I'm actually pretty proud to see how many people are actually kind of uh, having rooms or even all the, their entire flats giving over to, to refugees and stuff like that. Let's see how long this you know, kind of stays like that. But but I, I would assume, given that the, these are mostly women and children who come over because the men are not allowed to, it makes it easier. Just it might, might, might sound cynical, but I think it's easier to kind of organize a wave and stuff like that, which is good, I think. On on the um, economic perspective, my, my um, I mean, we could talk a lot about that, but probably the most important thing to my mind is there is a lot going on right now in preparation of programs of large scale European and and state run programs. And the problem seems to me that, I mean, you heard that Germany actually overnight raised the spending for defense by 100 billion, which is unheard of. And it's a social, social democratic chancellor. Uh, but that means there's a lot that needs to be paid in the future, right? We, we are doing this right now on the basis of a very strong budget and a good situation and everyone was expecting economy to pick up again but i i would assume there's a lot to come 
they're already discussing programs to support specific companies because either the supply chain is disrupted or they, they lose their uh, export markets or a mixture of both of that. So there's a lot of companies who actually struggle, whereas on average, the situation isn't that bad. But um, if you look at, at uh, let's say, chemical or steel industry or something, there's really the abyss actually looming. So there's a lot of money to be spent there. There will be a lot of money spent on green energy, green energy transition, which is welcome and necessary anyway. But I think, again, there'll be a lot of that will be uh, debt financed and uh, nobody right now understands how to actually pay back for, the, for that all. And as I said earlier, I think most of these programs will will be run and established by the state rather than that the private sector is being included. There have been some ideas on, on let's say, the Norwegian model, some kind of state fund that would also invite private investors at least to, to put in some money, but that's probably not going to happen. So that means we have a, an, another decade of state spending, of excessive state spending uh, in front of us. There's probably no alternative. I, I, I don't actually kind of criticize that, but I just see the problems looming. We have this baby baby boomer generation going into pensions uh, right now, starting to do that, and uh, also a lack of uh, employees and, and uh, labor force and stuff like that. So um, there's a lot of economists much cleverer and more intelligent than me who tell me this is probably kind of amassing to a very, very problematic situation three to five years from now. Right now, everyone is pretty optimistic after Corona, and we spent a lot of money for that. There'll be another spending spree on, on, on the post-Ukrainian stuff. Now, the future, I think, as we discussed earlier, I think from the German perspective, the question is, there's always a day after. And I hope it's going to become soon. But <clears throat> even if this takes uh, this war takes a long time, there'll be a day after where Russia still is our neighboring country in, in Germany. And we need to <clears throat> also at least start thinking about how to establish new ties and probably come up with a new security architecture and a new political structure uh, in order to kind of ensure a good neighborship, neighborhood in the future and in the decades to come, right? That's uh, something that nobody is overseeing right now, but it's obviously a big thing because we, we didn't do that in the last two decades and we, are, we need to do that in, in, in the upcoming decades, I think. No, that, yeah, makes, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and also something to add to this. I mean, we have the uh, the economic uh, impact. It's of, of course of much lesser scale in that sense in Iceland, but it's mainly the fish. Uh, we sell that uh, a lot of fish to Russia and Ukraine as well. And also for the tech companies, we buy a lot of uh, programmers. You know, uh, the, the development are in those Eastern European countries, so it does affect in that sense. But I think it's also something. I mean, pre-war as well is the total world debt. You know, for every three dollar we all we have one. You know, it cannot be serviced. I mean, that's a whole bigger thing. Uh, uh, how are we going to get out of that? You know, so I I, I don't know. You know, and no, no, press. If, if we exchange gloomy, let's say, <laughs> I, I, I add one more because I think that one of the biggest, to my opinion, but I'm probably the only one here, but. Uh, one of the biggest threats seems to me that Russia and China actually start engaging into uh, developing a second world currency right now, right? Yeah. They've, they've done so for some time, but I think their uh, ideas and their activities are actually increasing, which means if we look at the U.S. budget deficit, if there one day is a second global currency, that'll be pretty tough for the Americans actually, right? To um, come up with solutions for that, what is it, four four thousand billion, whatever trillion, fantastillion, I don't know, but a lot of money out there, right? And many zeros, <laughs> many many zeros, right? Yes. So, more so more zeros than I care to think about. Yes, I, I have um, a, a lot of qualms about rec weaponizing the SWIFT system mm -hmm. um, because that will. That that I think will accelerate the development of of, uh, of the digital yuan and 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 a, and a parallel financing mechanism. And I think there are a lot of there are certain sanctions where there there are likely to be unintended consequences, much like the expansion of of NATO, the kind of the breakneck um, triumph you know triumphalist. Uh, 
uh, uh, expansion of NATO after the um, after the collapse of the, the Soviet Union, there there wasn't a lot of introspection about the implications and unintended consequences of uh, of expanding NATO as rapidly as we did. I think weaponizing SWIFT has the potential to be that same kind of seminal turning point where 10 years from now we say we really didn't intend for this to happen and we've we've accelerated up we've accelerated a path um i would encourage um we'll continue to talk but those of you in the audience if you have questions please enter questions into the chat box and i will try to pick them up and and direct them uh, direct them appropriately but, but I think you really hit the nail on the with, with that one because just like we say, we want to be independent for our gas and oil. They they want to be financially de- independent, and by by closing SWIFT and everything, we just push that absolutely. Yeah, so uh, I have I have spent a lot of my time this week talking to to people about the China dimension. I spent a couple of hours um, in my in my office earlier in the week with. Um, uh, with with somebody who who focuses on China and has done a lot of work on on uh, what she calls the great decoupling of the the U.S. and China, and I do think that that Xi Jinping is probably having some buyer's remorse right now about the the closeness um, mm-hmm. between the between the two countries, um, and so you know perhaps there will be a little bit of a of, of a rethink about um, who he's. Um, Embraced as a junior partner in a partnership between between China and Russia. Um, however, I think the gloomy side of of that point of view is that um, there's a school of thought, at least in the, in the U.S., that that she will look at what's happening in Ukraine and say, well, maybe I need to think twice about um, trying to take Taiwan by force. I think the more likely scenario is she says to himself, well, if I decide that we want to try to take Taiwan by force, we're going to do a better job of, of, of uh, executing a plan than Putin and Russia have. So I, I'm afraid that there may be the, the, maybe not the lessons learned from this crisis that we would like China to learn, um, because I, I do see uh, the China-Taiwan relationship as being another potential flashpoint that's even more significant for the world stage than what's what's happening in Ukraine. If I may chi- chime in, I, I'm not the China expert or something. I've been there oftentimes and also kind of supported some Chinese companies. My, my yeah, I mean, we were all wrong with Putin, so I'm, I'm probably wrong with my, my assumption, but it is that um, China to my opinion, follows a totally different path. I, I would assume if, if you visit the area, Singapore, uh, Malaysia, and, and all these countries around them, they, they all kind of admit already that China is that important to them that they wouldn't be able to actually kind of politically or otherwise decou- decouple themselves. So that means, from my point of view, the Chinese, if there is a strategy, I would assume it's probably much more around they will fall into our laps rather than we need to grab them which is definitely different if you are a strong and very well organized country like China and with all due respect compared to a lesser less strong and probably less well organized Russia right i mean after <laughs> all, with, with all due respect to the russians and I, I don't want them to actually come to me right and but but i would say uh, the, what we see unfolding right now is is not necessarily the move of a very strong self confident country and to my opinion, China is, for good reasons, very self-confident and very strong. Whereas Russia tries to uh, make a last move in order to get back to back to some kind of former stature or, or kind of greatness or whatever. So I think um, I, I, I wouldn't assume that that both countries actually rub shoulders too much. I think uh, the Chinese actually go for strength and for importance rather than uh, kind of adopting. Let's say someone who is not able to to come up um, with something itself, but I would assume on on the on the currency part that'll be an ideal chance, as you said. It probably is something we all don't calculate with, but something that will evolve very fast now, and that'll put some pressure on the West. I, I would assume. Yeah, I, I would agree, and I would agree with your assessment. I think in a, in a lot of ways, um, Russia's expansionist tendencies are fueled by domestic weakness and and 
and Putin being concerned about domestic weakness, where like the, the contrast with China. You know, I'm still of the opinion that, that that China will exercise soft and some hard power to um, influence um, uh, influence those around them, including Taiwan, but will will not feel the domestic need. Um, most, I think, most Chinese consider Taiwan to be part of part of China, mm-hmm. and and Xi Jinping doesn't have to uh, doesn't have to invade Taiwan to um, to change that to change that point of view. And he's much stronger internally and a much stronger much stronger economy. I'm never sure with these things how much I'm talking my own book because we do have significant investments in China, mm-hmm. and so. The the thought of of uh, of uh, a a more dramatic decoupling between the U.S. and China is unthinkable to me from a, from a, in portfolio terms. <laughs> so there there's always there's what you what you know to be true, what you think to be true, and what you hope to be true. And on a given day, I'm not sure which category some of my thinking falls into. And I think also you cannot really compare in that sense China and Russia, like uh, U.S. But just the U.S. debt to China gives them a lot of leverage as well, you know. So uh, I, I think it will be a totally different. Uh, but there, there is a lot more mutual dependency than either country would like to admit. Whereas with Russia, certainly, Torsten, you know, your backyard is the most vulnerable to. Mm-hmm. Um, to instability in Russia, given the dependency of Europe and, in particular, Germany on um, on Russian natural gas. So, um, yeah, we're very different, very different framing. So we have about two minutes left. Any closing thoughts that you that the two of you would like to share? It, it, it's hard to actually kind of change the direction of our talk, right? We've been pretty gloomy for the last minute, so uh, <laughs> let, let me just. I hope we actually uh, uh, have have another talk like that six months from now, and we are all happy and glad to invest in Russia again and help the Ukrainians to rebuild their economy. I hope that, but let's see. I uh, I think the wor- the world is a resilient place. Um, and the resiliency of the of the Ukrainian people is is inspiring to me. And I think in a few minutes we will hear from a a, a panel. Um, I would I think will be both sad but also inspiring at the same at the same time. I am hopeful that we can all find a way for the Russian people and Ukrainian people to come out of this with no you know, further loss of life and, and, and damage. So um, I, um, on a humanitarian, I, it would be nice to end on an, on, a, on, on an optimistic note. I will say f- from a market's point of view, the resiliency of markets, I, I think, is not to be underestimated. And I show our clients very often a chart that we call the wall of worry chart. And it's basically going back decades in time, showing all of the things, all of the horrible things, that, all of the reasons not to be in the market. And it shows a trend line of markets generally generally going up with, with interruptions every so often, um, but generally markets being resilient and providing better returns um, than putting one's money in the mattress. So I can end on an optimistic market note at least. <laughs> yeah, I, th- I think these were really good last uh, last words. So let's just hope that this war will be- get solved very quickly. Well, I want to thank both of you for um, for participating in Horasis with me. It's been it was fun planning the session and and fun having this discussion. Thank you in the audience for joining us, and stay tuned for more great sessions ahead. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.